We're looking at the life of David on a Sunday evening. And last time we looked at David going out with his army to conquer different nations round about Israel. He was victorious in everything that he did and he was able to enrich his nation and provide materials to, to enable the next king to build the temple later on. And in the last three verses of chapter 8 of 2 Samuel, we were told of the different men who held positions of leadership under David. So David is now at the pinnacle of his success. He'd never had it so good. We remember all those terrible times he had living in a cave and being hunted here. and everything. Now he's, he's in a great situation. Everything's going well for him. And his people were appreciated of what they'd what he'd done for them. Nobody was against him. There was a great deal of prosperity for everybody. Everything in the garden was lovely. It was blue skies all the way. And yet, and yet, there was something niggling David, something at the back of his conscience, something that wasn't quite right. Indeed, it was something that had happened in the past when he promised his great friend Jonathan that when he became king, he would look after Jonathan's loved ones. He'd made that definite commitment. And even though Jonathan had been dead now for about 15 years, David knew that there was this responsibility upon him to fulfil what he had promised. And that it would go against him if he failed to carry out this obligation. There are people today who've made promises years ago but who have neglected to carry them out? Do their consciences trouble them? Or have they forgotten about it now? Too many people enjoying a high position in life forget about the people that they've left behind, those who they should have helped but haven't done so. And so chapter 9 of 2 Samuel opens up by David inquiring, were there any left of Saul's family who were still alive? so that he could show them kindness for Jonathan's sake. Saul's family would have included Jonathan's sisters and their children, but his brothers were now all dead, and their descendants were probably few in number. And no doubt David would have helped them in some way. But it was Jonathan's own family that David was really interested in, and perhaps he should have inquired about this a long time before. However, better late than never, you see, Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, was only five years old when his father died, but now we find him with a son of his own, in verse 12. So it would seem that Mephibosheth was now in his early 20s. But what had David done for him? And that's a solemn question there. Is there any that is left of the house of Saul? For it shows that most of Saul's descendants had been slain. They were dead. And it confirms the fact that the sins of the father had been visited upon the children. But David makes it clear that his interest in finding the relatives of Saul was so that he could do them a kindness. In no way was he seeking to get his own back because of what Saul had done against him in the past. David was in good spiritual health at this time, and so he had a heart that wants to be kind. God is said to have a heart full of loving kindness. It's a lovely word, kindness, if we stop and think for a moment. It's when you want to be nice to people without any expectation of getting something back from them. And God wants to be kind to us just because he's a God of love. And just like David wanted to be kind for Jonathan's sake, so God wants to be kind for Christ's sake. Just the thought of Jonathan made David pass over all the injustices done against him by Saul. And the thought of Christ makes God pass all over the injustices that we've done against him. Now in verses 2 and 3, David's servants find out that there's a man called Ziba who'd been a servant to Saul's family and they brought him to David. And the king asked Ziba, was there anybody left of Saul's family to whom he should show a kindness, the kindness of God? He calls it the kindness of God because God had been witness of that covenant. The covenant he'd made with Jonathan, God had been there. And also because all the kindness in the world originates from God, and it's always God's will for people to be kind, 
and those whose friends have died to see that their children are looked after. As the New Testament says, pure religion and undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. So surely there must be the kindness of God within every Christian. It's interesting that Jonathan actually said to David when they'd made their covenant, Thou shalt not only show me the kindness of God while I'm alive, but to my house when I die. And David obviously remembered those words precisely. What is also a challenge here is the fact that David overcame his natural reluctance to help any people who were descended from Saul. Indeed, we have the words, the house of Saul, in each of the first three verses. It all says the house of Saul. Our Lord said in his Sermon on the Mount that we should love our enemies and if anything seek to do good to them even though they've been bad to us and that's a very difficult thing to do as are a lot of the requirements of Christ. You see, David could easily have said to himself well I know I made that promise to Jonathan and I meant it at the time but taking the house of Saul as a whole they only ever caused me trouble. And Saul himself would have killed me on several of the occasions had he, not, had, had he had the opportunity. Anyway, that was all a long time ago now. Can't be held against me now after all this time. But that's not how David responded. He's interested in helping the house of Saul. And it's not as if any of them had come to him begging for help. He's actually going out of his way to try and find out if he can do anything for them. Anyway, in the latter part of verse 3, Saul's servant Ziba tells David about Mephibosheth, how that Jonathan had left him behind as a young son who'd had a bad accident. Do you remember what had happened? I'm sure a lot of you do. The nurse had dropped him while she was in a hurry to get away from the Philistines, and his legs had been damaged and would never be the same again, so he was a cripple for life. And now he lived in obscurity, having little hope of enjoying life at all. Ziba further tells David that Mephibosheth lived with a man called Machir, a very kind-hearted man who had taken pity on the young cripple and had given him financial support all these years. Later, when David was on the run from Absalom, the same man, Machir, brought David a lot of necessary items so as to help him in his time of need. And it's thought lightly that David had rewarded Machir for looking after Mephibosheth all these years. So David should have been paying for the upbringing of Mephibosheth, but this other man was doing it instead. And that's why Machir was so keen to help David when he was in trouble. Machir reminds us of that calling in the New Testament in Corinthians, which is simply called helps, helps. Certain people God has called to be helps. The Lord has made some of his servants to be great helps or helpers. In the New Testament, they were mainly ladies. But we thank God for all those men and women and young people who go round to the homes of people who are in difficulty and seek to help them in some small way without anybody else knowing anything about it. And those other Christians who give gifts to people anonymously so as to help them through those days when they're hard up. David did not know when he showed kindness to Mephibosheth that the day would come when he himself would need someone to show him kindness. As Proverbs says, he that watereth shall be watered also himself. In other words, if a person is poor and very thirsty and you give them water, then God will make sure in the future, when you're thirsty, somebody will give you water. It's the same solemn thought that we need to bear in mind that the cartwheel of life keeps turning around so that those who are at the top come to the bottom and those at the bottom come to the top. So when we're at the top, we should show kindness to those who are at the bottom. For although it might seem unlikely to us now, the day may well come in the future when we will need somebody to show us kindness. Anyway, eventually Mephibosheth is brought before David. He didn't know why he was being summoned. 
Perhaps he thought that David was going to act against him because of what his grandfather had done. But when he comes before the king, we're told that he falls on his face. He's a crippled, crippled boy, but he falls on his face and does reverence before him. When David had said goodbye to Jonathan years before this, David had fallen on his face. And as I've just said, time so often changes people's positions and circumstances and turns them around so that those who are up can go down and those who are down can go up. Now David quickly puts the young man at ease and calls him by his name, Mephibosheth. It's as if he remembered that little boy years and years ago and could hardly believe that he was meeting him again. Perhaps Mephibosheth looked a bit like his father, Jonathan. That would have made a great impression on David. Fear not, says David, there's nothing to worry about. I will show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. I loved your father a great deal, and I thank God for every remembrance of him. His love for me was very wonderful, and I owe him a great deal. And I intend to do what I can to make it up to him, even though he's now dead. I'm going to restore to you, his son, all the land and property that was owned by Saul. From now on it will be yours, and all the money that comes in from the produce and from the rents and so on will all be yours for you to live comfortably on. And what is more, I want you to become a constant guest at my palace and to join with me at the meal table. Not only will you fare well, I will have the pleasure of seeing Jonathan across the table. As I look at you eating your food, I'll have the pleasure of seeing Jonathan in you, my great friend. So I'm going to gain something out of it. You were born to be a prince, and I'm going to see to it that you live like a prince, for you mean a lot to me. Now, needless to say, all this is a picture, a very wonderful picture of how God brings a sinner to himself. The first thing we need to notice is that David took the initiative. It was not Mephibosheth who was seeking David. David was seeking Mephibosheth. Nobody even suggested to David that he find Mephibosheth. And so it is with God. He's the one who seeks the sinner. It's not the sinner who seeks the Lord. In fact, it says in the book of Romans, there is none that seeketh after God, none that seeketh after God. No, not one. If the Lord hadn't come after us, we would never have come to him. We would have been lost in our sins. Secondly, Mephibosheth had got nothing to offer David. He was lame. He couldn't work. He could hardly walk. And so it is with a sinner. They are spiritually lame. They can't do anything for God. But God doesn't bring us to him so as to get something out of us. He brings us to him because he loves us. Thirdly, there was nevertheless a good reason why David helped Mephibosheth and that was because of Jonathan who he dearly loved. And likewise, all the blessings which we receive are because of God's great love for his son, Jesus Christ. Mephibosheth was nothing to look at. He was disabled. But David could see Jonathan in him. And likewise, the life of the sinner is unattractive to God but he can see Christ in them when they're converted. When a Christian is feeling down because they think that their Christian life must look bad in God's sight, they should cheer themselves up with the thought that God sees Christ in them. The trouble with most Christians is that they can never get out of their mind that falsehood which says that God loves them more when they're living a good Christian life than when they're living a bad Christian life. And he's got more desire to help them when they're spiritually minded and zealous for good works than when they're earthly minded and their love has grown cold. David's desire to help Mephibosheth was not based upon the young man himself at all. In a sense, it didn't matter what Mephibosheth thought of David. David was helping him because of his father, Jonathan. As it says at the end of verse 1, I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And that's the same with the Christian. Whatever may be true about us, and let's face it, sometimes we're more zealous for God than others. He never stops loving us, and he never stops helping us, because it's nothing to do with ourselves. It's all because of Christ. 
Fourthly, Mephibosheth was delivered because of a covenant made before he was born. And although it's difficult for us to understand, the Christian is saved because of the eternal covenant made between God and Christ before the Christian was ever born. David's covenant only covered the members of Jonathan's family, nobody else. And likewise, God's covenant only covers those who are in Christ's family and nobody else. Fifthly, the name Mephibosheth means a shameful thing. It's very strange in the Bible, you get people's names and they're horrible names and you wonder why their mum and dad gave them that name, but there it is, a shameful thing. And that describes men and women very accurately. Isaiah says that we're all as an unclean thing. But David would do all he could for the shameful thing and God is the same towards us. Mephibosheth was lame as the result of a fall and men and women are spiritually lame also because of a fall. The fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden because of their disobedience to God. So all their descendants have a fallen nature and this means that man has original sin going right the way back to Adam and Eve. In his previous days, Mephibosheth's one purpose would have been to have kept out of David's way. So how surprised he must have been to learn that David only sought his good. And how surprised the sinner is when they believe the gospel and realise that God is only seeking their good. When the prodigal son returned to his father, his father didn't tell him off, didn't rebuke him. And once a person's repented and sought for forgiveness through Christ, they're completely pardoned and their sins are not held against them anymore. And just like Mephibosheth was given an inheritance and invited to the king's table, the saved sinner is given an inheritance in heaven and we shall feast at the table that's prepared for us. We don't deserve our inheritance no more than Mephibosheth did his. And as Mephibosheth sat at the king's table, his deformity would be unseen, for the lower part of his body would be under the table. And when we feast with Christ in paradise, our previous sinfulness will be blotted out from his view. Even now the Lord no longer looks at our weaknesses and failings as we have fellowship with him. Now in verse 8, Mephibosheth speaks very humbly and calls himself a dead dog. What is your servant that you should even look upon a dead dog like me, let alone favour me? Poor Mephibosheth. For years he'd looked at his hopeless situation. He had to face up to the fact that he was a cripple. He would never amount to anything. He'd never be able to do anything useful. And he felt as worthless as a dead dog. In those days there was no disability pension. He couldn't work for a living. And when a man is in that situation he can start to get an inferiority complex and Mephibosheth by now felt he was a complete washout. He couldn't understand why a great king like David would want anything to do with a wretch like him. And this is how a sinner feels when they receive Christ into their heart and life. They realise how bad they've been and that they were nothing before Christ met with them, and then they're amazed at the grace that God shows them. As the famous hymn says, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch, a wretch like me. Well, is that how we feel? Do we feel totally undeserving of what God has done for us? Mephibosheth didn't feel entitled, entitled to what he was given, it wasn't one of those people with a chip on their shoulder who think that they're hard done by and deserve better treatment than they're getting. He wondered why anyone would want to be kind to him at all. How lovely to mix with Christians of a lowly spirit. People who, no matter how well they do in life, or what position they occupy, or what scholarships and degrees they've attained, are nevertheless very humble and self-effacing. All that Philippians was always adhered to where it says, by lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than ourselves. Or as that lovely hymn puts it, true lowliness of heart that bears the humbler part and o'er its own shortcomings weeps with loathing. 
Now in verse 9, David calls for Ziba, Saul's old servant, and tells him that all Saul's estate is now to be given over to Mephibosheth. You may remember that Saul's father, Kish, was described as a mighty man of substance. So he must have had much land and property. But much of this land had probably been squandered away by Saul's wickedness. But now it would be restored to Mephibosheth. The Christian's ancestor, Adam, had a great estate, but this was forfeited by his sin. But now it's restored to the Christian. And so Mephibosheth's estate is now committed to the family of Zeba to run on his behalf. They knew all about the estate and how to get the best out of it. We've got those amazing figures in verse 15, or not verse 15, where it says that Zeba had 15 sons and 20 servants, and that they would do all the work, and Mephibosheth would become very rich, and the way that David puts his words in the latter part of verse 10 suggests that Mephibosheth would not need much from the land himself because he's going to spend most of his time at the king's palace. He would receive more and more, but spend only a little of it. Perhaps the main beneficiaries of the estate would be those who work there. It's rather like it says in Ecclesiastes. When goods are increased, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owner thereof, save in the beholding of them with their eyes? You see, everybody needs a certain amount of money to live on. But all that you can do with a vast amount of money is merely to look at the figures in the bank book. Probably most people would feel they could do with a little bit more money, but it's not because a little bit more money would get them more food to eat. They're already having enough food at the moment. In verse 11, Ziba says to the king that he will carry out this commission and do all that he can for Mephibosheth. And it would appear that Ziba welcomed this news for it basically meant that he would now be in charge of a vast estate and live himself very comfortably off the fat of the land. And as Mephibosheth would rarely be there, Ziba could please himself in what he did. In a later chapter, we see Ziba trying to cheat Mephibosheth out of what was his. It shows that some people are never satisfied even when they're given a lot. And it shows the depravity of human nature when a person has been given a great deal, but they're actually trying to steal from the person who's given it to them. This is going on in our society today in a great, great way. You get men and women who've been given all sorts of free benefits from the welfare estate, and yet some of them are trying to steal more by telling lies and abusing the system. Or those boys and girls who come to church youth work and are given chocolate and lemonade quite freely, yet some of them try to steal more from the very people who are giving it to them. It shows what the Bible says so often, that human nature is rotten, that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, and how much every person needs to be completely forgiven through trusting in the blood of Christ, to cleanse them from their sin, to be made a new person in him, so there's some desire of holiness in their life. David says at the end of verse 11 that Mephibosheth would eat at his table as one of the king's sons. So the young man was going to be looked upon as one of David's sons. That's how much he loved him. And of course that's another picture of the saved sinner because they become a child of God. We're then told in verse 12 about Mephibosheth's young son whose name was Mika. He too would enter into a lot of a blessing simply because he's related to his father. So whilst it is true that children can lose out because of the sins of their parents, they can also gain by the salvation of their parents. In the last verse, we, feel, we see Mephibosheth living at the palace in Jerusalem, being continually at the king's table. How wonderful this must have been for him. It's as if he went from rags to riches. And so it would be for those who put their trust in Christ, They've already been taken from spiritual rags to riches and one day they'll be taken to heaven and be continued at the table of their king, the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope this is true about you. 
and that all of us may eventually be lifted up to sit at the table of Christ in heaven. Amen.